Amen. Thank you, Jared. As you're seated, let me invite you to open up your Bible to Joshua chapter 23. Joshua 23 is where we'll be this morning. We've been going along in Joshua, and uh, you can look and see. You turn a page, and we are almost to the end. We've got three or four more sermons in Joshua. We'll finish it out in Joshua 24. And by chapter 23, you can feel uh, the end of the story approaching as Joshua is now an old man, and he talks about being old makes a speech as an old man, and gives some words of wisdom, Joshua 23. So if you, st if you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Joshua 23, we'll read from verse 1 down to about verse 8. Grass with us and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 1. <clears throat> a long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies... And Joshua was old and well advanced in years. Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders, heads, and judges, and officers. And he said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight and you shall possess the land just as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very strong. Be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, I pray by the blood of Jesus and the power of the Spirit that you would begin the healing process in the souls of those that feel so wounded. We ask that you would bring back the joy of salvation God, we pray for those that are trapped in sin. God, that you would open the doors to the cross of Jesus today. We pray that Christ is honored, that our lives are turned toward the Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In 1951, in his farewell address to Congress, it was... General Douglas MacArthur that made famous the saying, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. And that seems to be a little bit of where we are here in the story. It seems to be what Joshua is saying in Joshua 23. We are headed to the end of the story. You see just a page over, we'll be done with the book of Joshua. Joshua is an old man now. <clears throat> We've been told that a couple of times back in chapters 13 and 14. Joshua is old. We're told it here in, in chapter 23, Joshua is old. And now he's going to say it himself, I am an old man. His partner Caleb, remember him, he's an old man too. He's a different kind of old man. Caleb is gone. He's already taken his mountain. And now in Joshua 23, Joshua turns back to the people of God to give them his last little bit, his last words of wisdom before he goes the way of all the earth. And I studied these words this week. And I think if we look long enough and think deeply enough, in these words we'll find hope and, and life and peace we, we might even find warning. You see, as the people, as the people in the story, the people of God that are going into a foreign land, in so many ways, 
we ourselves occupy a world or, or even a country that is not our home. Even still, even, even though we do live in a, I think, a dark world, by God, we've been, we've been called to live with joy in the midst of hostility. We've been called to live with hope in the midst of darkness. We've been called to find a way to flourish even in an increasingly evil day. That, that's partly why I think this passage, if we look at it long enough, I think this passage gives us, in, at least in part, a clear way forward. A way that challenges us with strength to live and, and how to find joy, even in the middle of an ever-darkening world we live in. Paul told Timothy that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but He gave us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. So today, as we just sort of meander, we're just going to walk through Joshua's speech, let's find a way to take these truths, to take them as they're written, and live them out to the glory of God, to the adornment of the gospel, and to the health of our own souls. Because following Jesus Christ is the hardest life that you will ever love. And I think this story gives us at least four, four ways of a life of joy in Christ. Let's jump into the text and find out what it says. Here's the first thing I want you to see. Number one, we ought to be counting the blessings of God. You should count in your life the blessings that God has given you. I am looking at a bunch of people that have received blessing after blessing from God. You jump in the text and you find right there in verse 1, the editor tells us in verse 1, that Israel has now been in Canaan land a long time. They've been in the promised land. Verse 2, we find out that Joshua is old. He's getting all the leaders together, so he gets the elders and the heads and the judges and the officers. Verse 2 tells us, gets them together. And there he states the obvious. I am old. He's not old like Caleb. Caleb says, I'm old and I'm still as strong as I was when I was 40. Not Joshua. Joshua says, I've been road hard, put up. I'm just old. And I'm ready for this to be over. And, and then in verse 3, he launches into this wonderful speech telling the people to look back. Join me there in verse 3. Look what he says to them right there in verse 3. You have seen. He says to them, you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. He's saying to them, remember now. Remember the blessings of God. Remember what God has done for you. Don't you remember crossing the, don't you remember crossing the Jordan River when God stopped the waters? And, and we walked across on dry ground. We put some stones up there and we're in the promised land now. And the first thing we come to is this town called Jericho, Fortress Jericho. It's a walled city. Don't you remember the ridiculous way we walked around it? And the walls fell down by themselves. Don't forget the victory we won that day when God threw giant hailstones down on our enemies and killed them. Or when he made the sun, even the author says, there's never been a day like it or since when the sun stood still. J Joshua says in verse 3, don't forget all that God has done for you. And at the end of that verse, down at the end, that how, how the Lord your God has fought for you. Now here's a good place for us to stop. And here is a great and wonderful truth, a discipline for you and I to get a hold of. Especially when we feel uh, embittered or overwhelmed or forgotten or if we feel cheated. It, it's good to, to maybe even start saying it out loud or, or for our benefit today, write it down. Think of the tangible ways that God has blessed you personally. I've had plenty of food to eat. 
many of you, there's evidence bias, plenty of food. I had to let this vest out this morning when I put it on. Afraid a button would fly off and hurt somebody in the front row. <laughs> Plenty of clothes to wear. I got people that call me friend and I call them friend. I got a church, we have a church to gather in that, that's heated and cooled. Roof over our heads. Many of you have jobs that maybe you don't even like the job, but it does provide. Some of you have had the, you've been able to save enough money, you've done some traveling. Maybe you can see your children and they are a gift, or if you don't have children, maybe that's a gift. <laughs> and friends, isn't it good to have friends, people that really walk with you, friends that, that stick by your side? It's a gift from God or healing. A lot of you have, some of you have been really sick and, and, and thought you were going to die, and everybody else thought you were going to die, and you're right on the brink of death, and God brought you back, and you're sitting here, and it's this gift God gave you. Or your finances. And you think, how in the world am I going to make ends meet? And, and, and God just does it. Or maybe you've never been sick a day in your life. And you can just say, thank God for the health that he's given you. You don't know, you don't know how good it is to have health unless, until you've lost it for a little while. Or, or thank God for, 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 for the protection. You're in this terrible car wreck and it... I mean, you can look at the pictures of the car and think, how did I survive? Or how did your child survive that? And you can think, thank God for his protection or his provision in your life. Or some of you sitting here in this sanctuary, you never thought you'd be at a church on a Sunday. You are such a sinner so far. And God has now given you this wonderful second chance. And you can sit here and, and thank God that it gives us second chances. Or the fact that people love you or you're able to have that emotive, that, that genuine love for somebody else, that your heart is not hard like it used to be. It's been softened. You can love. Or if you can't think of anything as a Christian, you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, it's good to thank God for Jesus dying on the cross for you. The way we understand salvation, atonement, is the word substitute. That, that Jesus died on the cross not as a martyr. He died there in the place of sinners. And there took the wrath of God. That's where the judgment is. You're not being judged. If you're in Christ, the judgment for your sin fell on Jesus. So, so there the judgment of God has fallen. And you can stand before God made righteous through your faith in Christ. And it's something you ought to be thankful for. It feels so... For those of you that have been forgiven of your sin by the blood of Jesus, there is a, there is a certain contentment and joy and humility that comes with just being forgiven. So many things to be thankful for. I, I was a part of a wedding yesterday. Uh, it was actually... Um, the young man came from the Mallow Creek campus and the young lady comes from... Harris Campus, their families are just involved, both places, came together uh, to get married, and there you have the whole church, it seems like. There are all these groomsmen. <clears throat> I, Kyler and I were sitting on the front row listening to the groomsmen talk. They're all getting ready for the rehearsal. They're talking, which can be a dangerous thing. You get a bunch of groomsmen together. We're sitting there listening to them talk, and hearing all of those young Christian men just they're talking about the church, talking about the Bible, they're talking about the Word of God, they're talking about the religion. It was, I mean, it was really a gift to my heart. To be in that wedding yesterday, there were seven, seven uh, leaders from Hickory Grove, five pastors. Uh, Alec Questenberry was in it, Blake was in it, uh, Kyler led in prayer, I led in prayer. Um, I didn't actually, neither one of us actually got to do it. Aaron Peters did it, but he's partly Hickory Grove. And to see all of the people that God has given the church, and it was just a gift from God. There are so many things that God does in your life every single day that it's good for you to turn around and just thank God for His blessing after blessing after blessing. And what Joshua is doing right here in this passage before he gives them kind of a sermon, he just says, verses 3, 4, and 5, <clears throat> don't forget all God has done for you. Not only that, that, you look at this passage and you see him talking about the nature of our religion, the nature 
of being a Christian. When I say our religion, I, I know that sometimes the rebuttal is it's a relationship, not a religion. That, that absolutely is true, a relationship with God through Jesus. But, but it is a religion. And the beauty of the religion that we're a part of, being a Christian, is that there is this wonderful personal nature. Five times in the passage, you see Joshua refer to God and he says to him, verse 3, He is the Lord your God. Verse 5, the Lord your God. Over and over, five times, he tells the people, don't forget, this is not some faraway God you can't know. This is the God that comes down to meet with you to dwell with you. This is the Lord, your God. And if you're a Christian, there's a wonderful truth to knowing that this is not some far away God. This is a God that knows your name and loves you. This is a wonderful truth that He's, he's loved you and saved you and pursued you and He's led you. He has unconditionally placed His affection on you. What did Paul say? If God is... If God be for us, who can be against us? So whether you feel loved or not, when you're in Christ, you know that God has unconditionally loved you. The nature of God saving us is personal. <clears throat> the nature of God saving us is personal. I thought about this a few weeks ago. Um, I was listening to preaching and not preaching. A few weeks ago, Connie and I were at home with covid Connie had COVID, and I had it pretty bad, and uh, she, she had a really good nurse that took care of her. It was me. And so I was at home doing that, and look, I mean, it's just by God's grace I didn't get it. I mean, because I was neck deep in the corona there with Connie. And so I'm at home on a Sunday, I'm watching Kyler preach, and, uh, you know, bemoaning the fact that I can't preach, and Kyler's up there preaching, doing such a great job. And something Kyler said stuck with me. He emphasized in his sermon, probably one of those prodigal son sermons he was preaching, emphasized in his sermon that, that God loved and saved the very worst version of who I am. Brothers and sisters, that's a mountain. That's a mountain of grace. It's what God gives us at the cross of Jesus. And, and it it makes following Christ the very hardest life that you'll ever love. So I want to plead with you this morning, just, stop, just from the text. We, we, should be, we should be counting the blessings, thinking about how has God tangibly blessed you. Let me give you another consideration from the Bible right here in this story. Number two, here's the second thing. We are to consume Number two, we are to consume God's Word. Consume God's Word. Let me take you there in verse 6. Now, we've had the outlay. The editor has given us sort of the situation. And then verse 6 has the therefore. Do you see it? So therefore, and here's the command. Notice what uh, the text says in verse 6. And as I read his descriptors of God's Word, what we're supposed to do with it, you can probably circle them right there in your Bible. Let me read it to you, verse 6. <clears throat> Therefore, be very strong to keep, that's one, and to do, that's two, all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, here comes the third, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left. So you just stack them up there. Keep, one, do, second one, don't turn aside. What we have here is Joshua reminding us that the very standard by which we are to live, the very direction of our life is the actual Word of God that, that as God's people we are to know it, we are to study it, we are to memorize the Bible and meditate on the Bible and, and then live out the Bible. God's Word is to be taught, and let's put it in a Christian, so what happens in the church? God's Word is to be taught in the pulpit, it is to be read at home, it is to be lived in public. So that every action you take is guided by God's word. Every reaction from something that happens to you is informed by God's word. That you are guarded and, and, and guided by the very word of God. You know the distinguishing mark of the people going into Canaan land? 
the distinguishing mark is they would go into a land that was previously pagan. What would be distinguishing about them is that they were people of a book. A book that is the self-revelation of God. That's why, as a Christian, learning the Bible and living for Christ actually go hand in hand. I mean, honestly, why would you claim to love a God that you actually don't really know? I mean, sure, you know by general revelation, that is creation, you can see that, that there is a God. Creation tells us that. But the specific revelation of who He is is found in the Bible. His Word has revealed to us. I mean, what did the, the half-brother of, of Jesus, his name was James, he wrote in James chapter 1, verse 22, that we are to be doers of the Word and not just hearers. The whole purpose, I mean, why do we want to know the Bible? The whole purpose behind becoming familiar with the Bible is to know God and to live for Him. What does the Bible tell us about God? That He's holy. That He's different from us. That God is a holy, loving Creator. What does the Bible tell us about ourselves? That you have dignity because you were made in the image of God. The Bible says that that dignity is God-given and every person has it. But that dignity in us has been disfigured because of our sin. A sin that is not just us being depressed or estranged or not having purpose. The sin we commit, I mean, you see the judgment here. The sin we commit is an offense to God. God being holy is also just and therefore will punish sin. That, that's our big problem. Along with other problems we have, the biggest problem we have is that sin has estranged us from God. But God also, the Bible says, is a loving God. The Old Testament points us to the New Testament this loving God that gives us Jesus Christ, the one who lived perfectly because we can't, died on the cross, takes the penalty for sin. God raised him miraculously in victory from the dead. And the gospel story is the offer that anyone who will turn from sin and believe on what Jesus has done, the finished work of the cross, the Bible says you can become a child of God. That's why we... we Consume the Word of God. So I'm asking you this morning to build into your life a discipline, a daily time that you are in the Word. Maybe you want to think through how in January you're going to read the Bible through for the very first time this year. Or, or maybe take a couple of passages and, and memorize them, go over them ten times a, a day and, and get it to, you have it in your heart and your head and you've got it memorized and meditating on it. Maybe you've done that and you need to take a full passage like maybe the Sermon on the Mount or, or, or memorize a chapter, Romans chapter 8, or take a whole book, go and memorize the book of Ephesians so that the Bible starts to get inside of the very fiber of, of who you are. When it comes time to listen to a sermon, you're bringing a Bible and you're interacting with the sermon because the preacher says something. You look to see, is that what that preacher, is that right? Is that what the Bible says? You're checking it out. You're interacting or in a Bible study or in Sunday school. And maybe it becomes part of you that you read the Psalms and you start praying the Bible. Or possibly you go to the book of Proverbs and you just, you just start on a proverb a day. Tomorrow's the 25th. You go to the Proverbs 25, you read it and you just read one a day so that you're getting all of this wisdom. We find ways to have the Bible enter our hearts so that we might live out the gospel. Why? Because following Christ is the hardest life that you'll ever love. We should be counting our blessings and we should be consuming God's word. Well, what else does Joshua say to the people? I'll give you a third thing. It's right down there in verse 7. Joshua tells us, here's number three, that we ought to be constantly fighting worldliness. Look at the warning. That seems to be the warning that Joshua gives in verse 7. When you read verse 7, you just hear what he tells the people as they're going into the land because all of the pagan tribes have not quite been, been pushed out. And if you're not careful you start becoming like them instead of them becoming like you. Let me show it to you in verse 7. That you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods. 
Look, look how descending, going down. Make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. You see how it's a descending into that, that apostasy or paganism? So it starts with mixing. Do not mix and then don't talk about or mention their gods. And then you got so familiar swearing and then you're serving and then you're bowing down. You see the, the gradual, some of, have, some of you know people that you didn't even know that that was go, this gradual digression or progression. It's what Joshua is worried about as they go into this foreign land. It starts with just mixing, being conversant, and then depending on, and it ends in full-on apostasy, which means turning away. By the way, we're seeing a trend um, in evangelicalism among the 20s or 30s of what's known as deconstruction. Many that otherwise profess Christ walking away. And that's actually what ends up happening to Israel when you read the book of Judges. I'm afraid that it's happened to so-called Christian people, sometimes so-called Christian families, oftentimes so-called Christian churches. And right here, in my estimation, I think you can support it with the Bible and what we've seen. Right here is the danger of soft, soft evangelicalism. What, what I mean by soft evangelicalism is a, an evangelicalism that says we believe the Bible, but we want to talk mostly about the things we are for and not the things we are against. That there, there is mostly positive doctrine, which is, a, I mean, everybody loves what's, what's positive. But when it comes to following Christ and knowing who God is, there is a putting off as much as there is a putting on. Along with an affirmation of what we believe about God, there is also a denial of what we don't believe. There is a saying yes to God. There is also a saying no to sin. And, and what Joshua is warning about in verse 7 is the imperceptible gradual slide into apostasy. Here, here is the gentle backsliding of what we used to think was a godly person. It happens to people. It happens to churches. I mean, that's what, I mean this is what Jesus prayed in, in John chapter 17 and the wonderful prayer of Jesus. John 17, verse 15, 16, and 17. Jesus said to the Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one, they are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. It is your word that is truth. Well, what I'm talking about is the old illustration, the old metaphor of the frog in the kettle. Do you know the metaphor of the frog in the kettle? The, the, the premise goes like this. That if you were to take a frog and drop him into some scalding water... As soon as he hit that water, he would jump out of it and save himself because it was so terribly hot, he didn't want to boil to death. But if you take that same frog and put him in a pot of really tepid, comfortable, warm, bath-like water, and you let that frog sit there as you gently turn the heat up under it, the frog would relax to such a degree that the Raising of the temperature would be imperceptible, and slowly as you turn it up, that frog would sit there until you boil it completely. Now, that is a gruesome thought for that frog, and the metaphor may or may not be true, but the point still remains. That the modern church, or, or let's just say the modern Christian, in so many ways could be in danger of being the frog in the kettle. The kettle being our society that we live in. We just get used to the society around us, for instance. Last week, Rachel Levine became, uh, was sworn in as the first transsexual four-star officer of any of our services, national services. 
It showed up, we saw it on the news, but by and large, most of society, including most Christians, saw that and just sort of yawned. What, what used to be, what, what could have been 30 years, and everything wasn't great 30 years ago, but what could have been outside of our imagination beforehand is now the actual reality that we we live in. That the temperature just keeps being raised and we just keep getting used to it. So that on a personal level, the things that used to maybe shock us or, or even horrify us or, or, or embarrass us, no longer do that. The things you couldn't think about ever looking at are now just right there in your, your home. The things that you might would be really upset by no longer. We just get used to the environment that we're actually living in. And this environment so desensitizes us that we no longer actually see those things that will lead to eventual apostasy. I mean, just take, just take in evangelicalism, that's people like us and broadly that believe the gospel, there's been this shift away there's been this sort of mocking of what, what's called the, the purity culture. Now, there, certainly legalism is not a great thing, but the purity culture just held marriage up and sex inside of marriage as the way God intends and just held that ideal up from the Bible. And now in lots of circles that we live in, it's just being, it's being mocked or, or, or take just take the role of gender, what it means to be a man, or what it, according to the Bible, not, not according to what the movies, according to the Bible, what does it mean to be a man, or, or femininity according to the Bible, or the exclusivity of the gospel, the need to put your faith in the crucified, resurrected Jesus. Well, what are we going to have to do to make sure we don't get so accustomed to the environment that we're not shocked anymore. We, we've, got to be, we've got to be diligent in the Word. We have to be gracious, not legalistic. We need to seek holiness, understand humility. We need to be biblical. But we need to be willing, as the writer of Hebrews said, to join Jesus Christ outside the camp. Do you know Psalm 1? You know the first verse of Psalm 1? You probably do when I start to say it. That psalm goes like this, the first verse. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, stands not in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You know the reverse of that is also true. Cursed is the man who walks in the counsel of the wicked, and he stands in the way of the sinners and sits in the seat of scoffers. God has called us. God has called you. God has called His people to be a set-aside kind of people. I mean, isn't that what Peter meant? Remember the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Isn't that what Peter meant when he said that you, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You, you are a holy nation. You are a people for God's own possession so that you might proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And today I'm, I'm asking you to, to count the blessings, think through how has God blessed you. I'm asking you to commit to consuming the Word of God. I'm asking you to fight, to constantly fight off worldliness because it creeps in. And I'll just punch this last one at you. This, I'll give you last, one last point. You can make it a, a half a point. That is, we are to, to cling to the Lord your God. You see it in verse 8? It's, it's straight verbatim what Joshua says. Joshua chapter 23, verse 8. Cling to the Lord your God. What does it mean to cling, to surrender, to, to yield? I want you to, I want you to trust this is a trusting of God. This is turning to God. This is seeking God. This is you believing 
God. This is being content in Jesus. In short, this is what it means to actually be a Christian. Following Christ, it is the hardest life that you'll ever love. And as we close this morning, I'd like to invite you just to join me in a moment of prayer with your heads bowed this morning. As you think about what we've heard, just a couple of questions. Off the top of your head, can you name ten ways God has blessed you? Is your salvation... Is your salvation the top one? And most importantly, do you cling to God, cling to God through the grace of the gospel? Are you counting on the work, the finished work of Jesus to save you? This morning we're going to sing, and when we do, we'll make that song a time of invitation. For any of you that would like to talk further about what it means to give your life to Jesus or maybe you'd like uh, one of the pastors to pray with you or to pray for you, if you'd like to come forward when we sing, that'll be the time for you to come forward and spend a moment or two in prayer. Father, thank you for your word that is good. We thank you for the grace that you've given us in the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the chance to worship today. We pray you would draw us more and more to yourself. Be honored in our lives. Lord, thank you for Hickory Grove. We, we pray your blessings here. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. You stand, please, as we sing together.